You're listening to That Gets My Goat on the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the show. I'm Big Anglovich. I'm Rich Outfield. Ooh, that was like a Barry White-esque Rich Outfield. It was all like sultry and full of soul. Really? I'm Rich Outfield. <laughs> I didn't intend it to be. I just wanted to get it over with. And I'm Big Anklevich. Welcome to the show, everybody. I'm not going to get into my normal character this time. I'm just going to speak from my heart and use my regular voice. Hi. Hello. <clears throat> now, I'll, I'll go back to Kermit. I think that's the way people know me and they'll, they'll be confused. Well, that's, that's all right. <laughs> I've told you about being around Hugh Laurie and hearing him use the British accent and say that's not how he really talks or uh, Christian Bale. Uh-huh. You know, he always speaks American on the set when he's playing an American. And then you, when you hear him with his real voice, you're like, <laughs> and they say Dick Van Dyke does a bad British accent. Listen to that. Anyhow, uh, I figured we ought to talk about your bad day. <laughs> it was a bit of a bad day. Yeah, you could you could say that. On um, Last week on Thursday, uh, I went out and there was this big fire on the mountain over the lake. And you live on one side of the lake and I live on the other. Uh-huh. And uh, I thought, oh, I wonder how close to Big's house that is. I mean, that looks like, from here, exactly where he lives. It was my house. And so I uh, <laughs> I wanted to ask you and you'd have none of it. You're just like, uh, yeah, I got better things to do than to talk to you. And so uh-huh. I never got to ask you about that's, the fire. That's my way. I'm sorry. It's just... <laughs> At the time, that was Thursday night, I... Wasn't worried about it. I didn't think it was going to be a problem. I came home from work and I went to bed. And apparently my son had some friends spending the night. And so they were... And they were playing with matches. They were downstairs, uh, you know, doing their thing. And I went to bed, woke up in the morning. They were still down there. And uh, the first inkling that I had that something was going on was first i guess you could you you actually started to smell smoke in the house despite the fact that all the windows doors etc were all closed i could smell the smoke coming in and i thought huh i don't want to stink up the place so i turned on the uh, vent over the stove i don't know if that's good or bad i was talking to my dad about that later and he's like yeah well the air that it's cycling in i mean it's cycling air out and then it's bringing air in to replace it and that's got to come from somewhere and i thought oh yeah maybe that wasn't a bad maybe i'm bringing in more smoke than i'm putting out (laughs) but uh yeah i started to smell smoke and then all of a sudden there was a knock at the door and uh one of my uh son's friend's mom was here and she's like oh is 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 ryan here and i'm just like yeah he's, he's here and she was Seemed to be walking around in sort of a bit of a panicked state. Ryan came up with his stuff all packed. And uh, and she says, oh, you know what? They're evacuating. Did you know that? They're evacuating everybody out of here. And I thought, yeah, sure, whatever. <laughs> and then seconds later, his other friend's dad showed up. Hey, Isaac here. And I'm like, uh, yeah. And then... He, yeah, they're evacuating. So I thought, oh, okay, I guess we're being evacuated from our houses. I had no idea. These people actually live north of where I live. Which a, is farther from the fire. Right, by a street or two. And yet they were uh, hightailing it out of Dodge. You knew there was a fire when you woke up? Or did you just put two and two together? No one had called. Your wife hadn't mentioned that there was a fire. Nothing? Uh, no, we knew it, when it had started the day before. I'd seen it. I'd seen it on the mountain when I was driving home the night before, too. It was all bright and, you know, at at night is the best time to see it because there's no smoke. The smoke doesn't get in the way or whatever the deal is that happens during the day. And it's the only light going on. So I saw it up on the mountain. and We live in a, you know, it's it's a grass fire kind of an area where I live. And there's been several fires. Even just this year, there's been like five fires on this mountain. It's a big mountain, so, you know, kind of all the way around the mountain, there's been a bunch of different fires, and they get put out fairly quickly, usually, and it's never been a big deal, but this time around, it wasn't. And yeah, they evacuated the whole neighborhood. I later found out, as I was driving out with the car, I heard a cop who was talking to somebody who was coming in, 
yeah, we're getting everybody evacuated. Uh, and they said from my street south is what they're, I think they may have actually said south of my street. I can't remember exactly how he said it, but I think he said south of my street. And I thought as I was driving away, oh, I guess I wasn't, I didn't have to be evacuated. Darn, I should have turned around. I should have turned around right then and there. Would have been the wisest thing to do. Famous but yeah. last words. <laughs> now, I haven't been here since the fire. How close could you see it from your house? How close to your house was this fire? You could see the huge plume of smoke and stuff. You couldn't, like during the day, you couldn't see the fire. Although on occasion, it would be in a space where you could see it. But yeah, it was pretty close. I mean, you could see it. But I would say it was still several miles. And, you know, when I talk about south of my street, there's like three, four, five streets heading in that direction before you get to just the open mountain. And so, yeah, when they're like, oh, we're evacuating, I was just like, I'm not worried. It's going to have to burn through 150 houses before it gets to me. So I didn't really take it all that seriously. I didn't expect it to be a big deal. But how did you know to evacuate just because the parents of the other kids nobody called or came to your door and said you need to leave sir nobody came to the door they may have called we actually have a phone that's hooked up that we never answer it's because we have a phone through one of those internet kind of phone deals or whatever and uh, we just get it for free and it's some weird thing where like you get 10 minutes of outgoing calls but like 500 ingoing or something like that So we just don't use it. We have cell phones that we use as phones. And that phone did ring that morning. We didn't answer because the only time it ever rings is like, Hi, I'm with Mitt Romney's campaign and I want you to vote Mitt. Hi, I'm with Barack Obama's campaign. I want you, you know, I don't want to hear the stinking campaign ads on my phone. And that's all we get. So I didn't bother to answer. It's possible they could have called. But then after those two people came and took their kids... Then all of a sudden, I start hearing sirens out in the road. And I look out there and you can see sheriff's cars driving around and they're on their speakers saying, evacuate the area, blah, you know, the fire. I don't know exactly what they said. I can't remember. But, you know, they're saying over their PA system that that they're evacuating the area. And I went out there and took a look. And I even took a picture. I think I put it on Facebook of the uh, fire from my front porch. And it it looks fairly close. I don't know. I was never too worried of my house burning down, but for some reason, I don't know why, I just wasn't worried about it all that much. I was just like, eh, we'll evacuate, and four hours from now they'll have it all taken care of, of and we'll come back. But (laughs) how would you know? And that's something I wanted to know the next day. It was like, well, how do you know when it's okay? Who talks to whom and... uh, It's not like they're going to call your cell phone. They know your cell phone number and say. I think in that case, you have to watch the news. It's funny. I didn't actually ever really watch the news. Um, I went to my sister's house and I don't think she has cable or TV. And she's one of those people that just gets Netflix and some of those things. So they don't have anything that's live. I did go to websites of television stations and check it out. And then they also referred me to Twitter pages. Um, so I looked on the Twitter page for my city and they would post, you know, oh, it's this many acres and they're going to meet about whether we can let a residence back when. And I have a cousin who works for the sheriff's department and he was here mm-hmm. going door to door. And I think this was much later on and I didn't talk to him, but my mom did. And she said that there were people that were like, no, you can't make us leave resisted that were, you know, unpleasant about it. And I don't know <laughs> what you do in this situation because... It's not something that's ever come up for me. Yeah, I don't um, know What either. if somebody's... And, you know, people... Well, I guess people in general. I was going to say people around here. But everybody is really protective about their home and really loud about their rights. Uh, it's an American thing. Yeah. It's like, you have no right to fill in the blank, you know. Or um, I have the right to... My constipational rights say that I can and fill yeah. in the blank. Anything that you say... It gives you, you know, there that's a, a very big American thing. Yeah, I remember there was a song by, what was the band's name that did that? Uh, standing outside a broken phone booth with money in my hand. Primitive Radio Gods. Primitive Radio Gods. That on that same album, I, I, I liked that, Standing Outside a Broken Phone Booth. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I was listening to the album to consider whether I wanted to buy it. And there was a song on there. And I remember there was one line in there where the guy says, I have the God-given right to smoke anything that I want. 
Really? Is that one of those inalienable rights? I didn't realize. I yeah, gotta I, read the Constitution closer. <laughs> it's funny. I, I don't know if other countries are like that, but we've had it so pounded into our heads that we're free, right? And that our forefathers left religious persecution or fill in the blank persecution, and that, that we're free, and that you have the right to remain silent on anything you can. <laughs> I, it's, 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 it's really funny. The, the anger that people have about stuff like that. and Yeah, and around here it's pretty fierce. I think you get some of that stuff a lot more in small town type areas where you get those kind of people that like, yeah, I got my gun and I'll defend my property from you pigs. Then again, maybe it's everywhere. Maybe you're right. Maybe it's just as much in urban areas as it is in small town kind of places. I, well, I, I'm sorry about interrupting you on that, but it just, it, what rights do you have? Do you have the right to just sit here with your friend? Because let's say you're a religious nut <laughs> and you're like, no, I believe the end times have come and my family and I are going to be protected by the force fields of Jesus. I, you can't make me do nothing. You see that kind of stuff all the time. It's like, you know, my religion says that you can't take kids to the hospital. Or, right. You know, whatever the deal is. And to a certain extent, people are protected by the Constitution to have whatever crazy religious beliefs they want. But there's got to be a line where you draw where it's like, but your child will die, sir. And, and, and in this case, it's like, okay, maybe these are the end times, but the fire is coming. And I, I don't know if you'll be protected or not. But I know that fire is... Fire bad! Bad. Uh, That's why we're in this business, Mr. I, I don't know why I'm even asking you this, because I don't know the answer. Yeah. I know you don't know the answer. <laughs> I don't. Yeah, I don't know what kind of rights you have as far as that. You have some kind of right to property in the Bill of Rights. There's something about property. But I, yeah, I'm not a lawyer and I'm not a constitutional scholar or anything like that. I don't study those things. I did go over it in high school way back when, but... I don't recall exactly what it would be. But yeah, I don't know. It was interesting because we came back here later. And this is way later in the story. And we're, we're, we're doing flash forwards here. But uh, we came back to the house to grab a couple of things. And while we were here, I saw my neighbor, my next door neighbor, come walking out on his bare feet. Oh, his, so he had no. Yeah, and his kids was there with him, and he went and he got his mail out of his mailbox and then went back into his house. He had his kid chop down your tree while you were Right. Uh, so <laughs> you do know, know people that didn't leave. I don't know if they never left, but at that point they hadn't left anyways. Maybe later your cousin or whoever it was that came knocking doors came and knocked on his and said, get out. And then he said, oh, I hadn't heard anything about it. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but yeah, we we're like, okay, I guess okay. we got to evacuate. Okay, so when is this during the day? This was at about 1030, I would say. In the morning? Yes. And you all, you loaded your family up in the van. Uh -huh. Had you talked to your wife about this first? I called her when I decided, oh, I guess we got to evacuate after all. Because, I, you know, when, once I saw the police, I, I was... I don't think we established your wife was at work. Oh, yeah, you were right. Here alone. She was well, at work alone. and I was here with the kids. Okay. And, uh, yeah, once I saw the police cars going around, I figured, okay, this is official. I probably better head out, even though I don't feel any actual danger yet. But you spoke to her. You didn't ask her, should we evacuate, Wait, right? You, you said that we're going right. to. Did she say, make sure you take this, this, and this? Because I, I don't know. I've never done this. But you always think about, okay, if you can only take one thing, what do you take? Uh -huh. Did you have the kids pack stuff up? And say, just in case, bring along this that, that you love. I wasn't really especially concerned. When I talked to my wife the first time, I was like, yeah, we're evacuating. And she's like, oh, are you going to bring this and that? Are you going to bring that? And I'm like, I'm, I'm not going to. It's well, not a problem. Sorry, I got to interrupt again. What did she want you to bring? She hadn't said in specific terms. She was just like, you're going to bring like stuff? And I was like, no, it's not a big deal. I'm not worried about it. I think we'll be back in just a few hours and so i was expecting to just basically go and meet up with her and give her the kids and she'd probably come back home and so because you too had to go to work right and so the thing that i packed was my lunch for work and uh i told the kids eh, pack some pajamas in case you have to stay somewhere and so the kids got pajamas and my daughter my youngest daughter she was all ready to just get prepared. She went and grabbed like this 
kind of, we had these little collapsible kind of basket thingies. Then she went and grabbed one of those and started packing her clothes into it. She went and grabbed like her favorite stuffed animal and put it in there. And she'd just gotten a couple other stuffed animals the day before. And she grabbed them and put them in there. And then she went ahead and got a change of clothes for the next day and put it in there. And uh, but this is an this eight year old. Is in a sense of adventure or a sense of fear that she did. I it? think a little of both. She, I think, had a little bit of fear. And I think that shows in the fact that she went and got Froggy, which is her favorite toy of all time. Um, and she made sure she had that one. And then, you know, the she went and got that, oh, I got new stuffed animals yesterday, so I got to get those too. And uh, then she, yeah, she started packing all sorts of stuff. And I told the kids, you know, to grab, my youngest daughter has a DS. Uh, the other two have Kindle fires. I told them to grab those things so they have something to do. Right, okay. And then my wife calls back and she's like, just in case, I know you don't think it's going to be a big deal, but just in case, bring the computer because that's got like all our photos on it. And then there's a folder in the filing cabinet that's the important documents folder and it's got like passports and birth and certificates and just bring that, okay? I know you don't think, you know. Those like, are the only two things? Yeah, that was. There was no mention of the cat. No, there was no mention of the cat. Well, see, I, I don't know. I've never had to evacuate. <laughs> there was a movie, a uh, one-hour photo, where they said that the, anytime there's a fire, the first thing that gets taken is the family pet. And the yeah. second thing is a photo album. And I, that always stuck with me. I was just like, wow, that's, what would I, you know, kind of thing. Yeah, the cat didn't really come, to tell you the truth, I almost left without ever even seeing the cat. Um, but again, I wasn't really worried so I didn't fear for the cat's safety. Um, I did, before we left, open the door and put the cat out so that if the house caught fire, the cat wouldn't be trapped inside. I figured cat is mobile and could get away if it needed to. There you go. You're no monster. <laughs> yes, I That am. you thought about that is... I know that my neighbor took his cat with him and he was really, he really regretted it. He told me later, he's like, the cat was just meowing constantly. It would not shut up. I don't know if it just smelled the smoke and was freaked out, but it just wouldn't shut up to the point where I was just like, why did we get a cat again? Like, ah, ah. So I put the computer in the car I put that folder, actually just took the whole box that had all the file oh. folders in it. I don't know what else was there, but it seemed easier to transport that way. It's a wonder we have the computer right now. Eh? Yeah, seriously. But you know, I, I did it was in the back of the car. When I talked to you, I didn't know where the fire was in relation to your house. When I was hearing about evacuation... You know, I, I don't know. I mean, maybe houses had already started going up and that. And, and it's weird. In a selfish way, I did say, oh, gosh, I hope he grabbed his computer. <laughs> That's the one of the things I grabbed because of all the pictures. I mean, I've got a lot of pictures on my computer. And you just constantly port those pictures over to your computer. Right. I put them over to the computer a lot, usually every few days because I, I do a blog for the family. That's, you know, about stuff that we do for my uh, various in-laws to see so I'm always doing stuff about that so I have the pictures ready to go and then I grabbed a spindle of DVDs that I have that were like slides from when I was younger that I had scanned years ago and more I thought, pictures yeah get those and then while I was at it, I thought okay what else like that is something that can't be replaced and so I thought and I said okay videos and so I went and I found the basket that has all of our old uh, videotapes in them. And then I went and I thought, okay, I've got some DVDs that have videos on them. And so I grabbed some of those, you know, the ones from when my uh, son was really, you know, like less than a year old kind of a thing. Okay, and this is all the time thinking that this is for nothing, that, this, that, that <laughs> yeah. is, there's, there's no danger. But let's say that a house or two had already caught and so you knew houses were going up. What would you have grabbed that you didn't grab? You um, know what I mean? Where you're just like, oh, shoot, this may be happening. Well, for one, the one thing that I didn't grab that would have been handy, even that day, had I just considered, okay, this might be overnight. I didn't even get a change of clothes. I just went with the clothes that were on my back. I expected I was going to go right to work 
and then I would come home to my house that night. I didn't consider getting pajamas, although, you know, I don't sleep in much for pajamas anyways. That seems like a kid thing to do or a woman thing to do, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> but if you're going elsewhere, of course, True. you would have taken them. Right. I would have at least gotten a change of clothes because the next day I had to wear the same clothes that I had on the day before. And by the end of that night, those things were getting awful ripe. I think I would have been a little bit more meticulous of making sure that I got all of the... Because like I have boxes of slides downstairs that I haven't scanned yet. And I just had to kind of leave those. Um, But if I knew the houses were actually going up... And I probably would have made sure to get all the things that I, you know, so that because those are the things you can't replace. I mean, there's thousands of things in this house and most of them I might say, oh, yeah, I remember when I had this. Oh, yeah, it's too bad. But, you know, even like old things like my collection of old toys and crap like that, I can find them on eBay and buy them again later if I have to because they're not one of a kind things. Whereas pictures, they're my pictures. No one else has them. There's no way to get them. Uh, videos and those kind of things are I think are really I mean we we talked about it on the show before about how important those kind of things are and how cool it is to be able to see video from when you're a kid or video of your children when they're small or whatever those kind of memorabilia type things are special in a way that other things just can't be I guess I don't know so I probably would have been a little bit more meticulous about that would you have taken the lizard probably i definitely would have taken the cat the lizard i don't know probably the lizard may well be better off if uh, he had other owners i don't know we're sad lame lizard owners <laughs> yeah i probably would have t- i probably would have taken more care for that kind of stuff too we would have got the little cat carrier out and put the cat in there and taken it with me and um not just left it outside and figure yeah you'll be fine but yeah, it is, a, it is a hard thing to think about. What are you going to take? And there's other stuff too. Like somebody was mentioning to me this morning when I went to work for the first time. They're like, oh yeah, what did you grab? Did you grab your journals? And I thought, oh geez, my journals. I have some journals. I mean, I haven't been meticulous with keeping a journal. But I have a few books that are full of crap that I wrote. That might be good to have. And like my wife has boxes of pictures that I haven't gotten around to scanning yet. And etc etc there's a lot of those kind of things that can't be replaced you can't go back to when you were young and remember what it was like and rewrite it okay so you're all loaded into the van describe leaving are there cars is every is it a panic are there lines of vehicles fleeing is are people fleeing at this point or is it just kind of a mosey if it's in between a mosey and a flea People aren't moseying, but they're also not desperate. They're not freaking out. They're like, come on, come on, come on. Get out here. Let's go. Ah, kind of a thing. You know, people are packing up and they're getting stuff in their cars. I actually had my son take some video as we're driving out. I wanted to just get some. He's pointing it down the street trying to get shots of the, you know, the the sheriff's cars driving up and down and stuff like that. And we drive past. You know, they got, they got people blocking off all the streets going south of my street blocking them off so no one can come in or blocking them off completely they're not blocking them off completely but they're standing there so that anybody that tries to go that way they can stop them and say hey uh, if you live down that way we're evacuating everyone there you know what i mean making sure that the word gets out and then we go around the corner and i saw that policeman that i mentioned earlier that said yeah the uh, evacuation is from your street south and i thought huh And yeah, then we pulled around and it was, I don't know, I thought it was an adventure more than a a panic or anything like that. And I wanted, that's one of the reasons why I wanted my son to get the video as we were driving out because it's something that can be cool to remember. Oh yeah, I remember last year, remember five years ago when we had to be evacuated. That was crazy, huh? And so, uh, yeah, I hadn't called anybody yet. I didn't know where I was going. I was just leaving. I had called work because, you know, I work in the news and they wanted to... uh, they actually were going to interview me live on the air. I was going to be the phoner interview about the evacuations. They like, yeah, can we interview? And I said, yeah, just give me you know a half hour to get out of here. Yeah, they kept calling me. My phone was ringing a lot as I was trying to get out of there. 
you know, I think you may have called me right around that time, did you? Or was it later? Can't remember. But yeah, you, my other friend uh, who lives across the way, everybody's like, yeah, are you close to the fire? What's going on? <laughs> it's like, I'm busy. So we headed out and I was not far from my house. Just uh, two minutes tops from my house. I get a phone call and it's one of the uh, people from work who is wanting directions to where the evacuation areas are so that he can go because he's he's a photographer that needs to go and, and video this for the uh for the news and so he's heading out there and i'm trying to give him directions on the phone and i had my i have this great big mug it's a 50 ounce mug uh that i keep full of water all the time and that it's one of those things that helped me lose weight when I was doing my lose weight contest thing. And, uh, yeah, I kept, I filled that up with water cause I figured we'd probably need it. And I had it sitting in between the seats in the van. We're driving down. And at this point we're onto the main road out of town and this traffic is now pretty heavy. You don't see traffic like this in my town ever because this is like half the town leaving now. And so the traffic is really heavy. And it's a two-lane road, meaning one lane in each direction. And so there's not space for everybody, you know. So we're going, and we were driving fairly slow, I'd have to say. Like 30 miles an hour tops. And, uh, yeah, I'm driving along my mug. As I'm talking to this guy on the phone, yeah, you got to turn here. And then you go here, and then my mug tips over. I'm sure, it's because I tapped my brakes a little, because the person in front of me had slowed. My mug tips over. And it falls down, and it falls down in just the way so that the one little hole that you drink out of is at the very bottom. And so all 50 ounces of the water just starts gushing out of that thing onto the floor of the car. And I'm like, ah! So I reach down to try and pick that thing up. And as I'm doing that, the person in front of me stops to turn left, and I totally rear-ended the crap out of her. The airbag's blue. And, uh smacked me in the face i totally bit my tongue like really bad it hurt for a like while. mouthful of blood uh, i don't know that there was mouthful of blood but it was like if you looked at it, it was chunks well yeah you showed me and there was big white yeah it was really like fleshy i don't even know what that gunk was like this white gunk that it and it was attached to my t- i actually pulled it out at one point it was like a string of tissue that came from my tongue but uh, okay, yeah. so you bite your tongue. How, how does it feel for the airbag to hit you? Because people can't see, but you've got marks on your arm where the uh, airbag right, hits yeah. you. Um, you know, the weird thing is, I barely even registered it. Aside from biting my tongue, and I didn't register the airbag hitting me and making me bite my tongue. It was. It may well have just been the sudden stop that caused me to bite my tongue more than the airbag hitting me in the face. I don't know. I do, when I did bite my tongue, you know how sometimes you bite your tongue, you, your mouth just suddenly waters really intensely? That I do remember. Um, but yeah, hit in the face with the airbag. Maybe it's the adrenaline or something that you get in a moment like that where I didn't even register the airbag. I know my son registered the airbag because he got hit with it really good. He was in the front seat because he's 12 now, and so he's, you know, loud in the front seat. He's a... He actually is big, though. He's like 5'3", so, I mean, he's as tall as many... As Wolverine. Yeah, there you go. He's as tall as many women are, and uh, so, you know, he's big enough to handle an airbag. If their adult women are allowed to sit in the front seat, I suppose he should be allowed, too. But, yeah, he got hit in the face good. He was also reaching for my mug, which had tipped over, and so he had turned his face to the side, and so he got the airbag on one side of his face. And, yeah, it smacked him really good in the lip and the cheek. And the scrapes that I have on my arm, he has very similar scrapes all over his face. Scrapes from the airbag, and he had a really big fat lip. Right after it happened, his lip swelled huge. Weird how fat your lip can get. No nosebleed or... No No nosebleed or ear bleed or anything like that. He had, you know, he had some scrapes and cuts, so he had a little bit of blood, but it wasn't, uh, you know, something that was bleeding a lot. He didn't get a cut. A deep enough cut to cause much blood. He just had a lot of swelling. His cheeks swelled a lot and his lips swelled a lot. And Okay, another interruption. Why didn't you have the baby in the car? Did have the baby in the car. Oh. <laughs> baby was in the car. 
My two other younger daughters were in the car. My son was in the front seat. And yeah, it was one of those weird moments, you know, because you're not ready for it. You know what I mean? I was completely unaware that I was going to hit this person when it happened. And so I'm just trying to pick up the drink off the floor and then poof, car stops suddenly. The airbag hits me in the face and everybody in the car suddenly freaked out. They're like, ah, what's going on? What just happened? And I'm like, uh, I just crashed the car. But and the, the other kids were not hit or hurt. They the weren't. No, they were in the back, so they didn't even have an airbag. They were just thrown up against their seat belts, which can hurt, but not nearly as much as... No seat belt. Right, no seat belt. Or also like uh, being hit by the airbag. You know, that's something that's actually being hit. They just kind of snugged into their seatbelt for a second, which that'll hurt like your hips and stuff where it wraps around, but only slightly. But yeah, my my youngest daughter starts freaking out. She's like, oh my gosh, what's going on? She's, you know, all, already a little bit panicked because we're evacuating our house. And now we've crashed our car as well. And the baby, of course, starts screaming. Obviously, that's the first thing that I'm thinking, oh crap, is the baby Okay. It's screaming. I go back and get him out. And once I get him out, he's fine. He's just scared. A sudden loud noise and a jerk. And, you know, that's the kind of thing that will freak him out. It was kind of a pain because now here I am with a wrecked car in the middle of... A two-lane. Yeah, a two-lane road. There's no... You know, I'm now blocking the evacuation traffic. I've got my car full of all the important possessions that we own. And now, you know, this car is not going with me anymore. My computer's in it, <laughs> which I don't want to leave in there. Okay, and so you get out of the car, you look at the front. It's the van, right, you're talking right, about? Right, it's the van. You look at the front of the van, what do you see? It's crushed. I. It's funny because the car that I hit, it did not hurt it much. Oh, okay. And it's the woman- got... In that car, she's fine? Yeah, she's she right? was fine. Yeah, that was another one of the first things that I did was go to make sure that she was okay, that I hadn't injured her. It was a Scion, one of those kind of boxy looking ones, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. The back end of it was kind of crunched in a little bit, but hardly. Just had kind of like a, a small dent and a little bit of paint scraped off of it. But yeah, the front of my car is just crushed in. It's totally munched down, and I'm looking at it. And I knew just by looking at it, there's no way that this car is going to get fixed. It wasn't a new van. I think it was a year 2000 van. And so, you know, it's not worth a lot to begin with. Fixing that much damage is going to take a lot of money. So I knew it was the end of the line for that car the second I saw how badly it had been crunched. Uh, the tires are fine? You, the tires were fine. So did you try and drive it off the road or what, what you know, happened? I didn't try to. I don't know if it would have started or not. But yeah, I never even considered trying to start the car that was this damaged. Looking at it, I figured there's, it's not going to start. I did eventually get some people to help me push it off of the road, which was really easy. I was kind of surprised how easy it was. It only took like me and like one guy and one woman and we all pushed it off the road really fast. And most of the time I was just jumping in and steering it. And those two uh, managed to push it almost all by themselves. You would think a big old heavy van would be harder than that. But I guess you put wheels on things and a great invention, that wheel. The woman in front of you, she pulls her car off to the side of the road too or she drives off or i'm assuming there's a line of cars behind you now yeah there was it was and they were making their way around us as they could and i kept you know first because nobody is coming in the other lane no yeah is the other into the other direction there was much less there was still some traffic because it was the middle of the day on a friday so people are at work and they find out their houses are being evacuated so they're coming home getting their stuff and leaving so there was okay. a lot of people coming in that direction as well but not nearly as many as going the other way Now I'm totally screwed. I have to call work, tell them that it's going to, at the very least, going to be a long time before I get there. I have to call the insurance, tell them that I've been in an accident. I have to call the police to get somebody out there. And the police are all busy. They're evacuating a freaking town. I have to call my wife, let her know that I've destroyed our car, and let her know that everybody's okay. Um, You still have to do an interview. 
Yeah, that's the other thing. I kept getting calls on my phone that I would ignore. And I later listened to the messages and they're like, can we get you to do that interview still? And finally, at one point, I answered the phone. I was like, no, I'm sorry. It's not going to happen. I, I just crashed my car now. So the interview's off. Sorry. But... <laughs> I wish my wife had been with me at the time because it would have been much, although she would have been the one hit in the face, so maybe it wouldn't have been much easier. But uh, it was kind of hard being the only adult of the family to tell. You know, I had to get the kids across the street. There was We were right in front of the school, so there was, you know, a nice big grassy hill for them to sit on. And then I had to go and unload the important things out of the car, get all the stuff out of there because we still don't get to go back to our house. You know, a, a policeman eventually stopped and took care of us. He was a policeman from like three towns over that was coming to help with that. And uh, he took the uh, accident report and all that stuff. And yeah, the, the worst part was we had to give get out our uh, uh, license and registration and proof of insurance and all that for the cop to see. And the girl gets out her registration and it's still just the temporary registration. Her car is brand new. Her car is a week off of the freaking lot. It's 2012 and they just bought it and I crashed on them. <laughs> that sucks. But uh, he, yeah, she hands him the registration. The cop's like, oh, ouch. <laughs> it's funny because I have never been in an accident I've, well, I should say I've never been the cause of an accident in my life. I've never hit somebody. I've been driving for more than 20 years and I've never hit somebody. Okay, of course, so it finally happened. At least it wasn't too serious. I mean, nobody was hurt. Well, were they? You look at your son <laughs> and at some point do you suspect that he, he we better check this kid out. What? what yeah. <laughs> did he act like maybe he had a concussion or anything like that? He did complain about his head hurting and stuff like that. And uh, when, the, when the accident first happened, the first emergency vehicle that came past us was an ambulance. There was an ambulance headed in the direction of the evacuation. And they're like, hey, uh, before we go, is everyone okay? Does anyone need to be treated and everything? And I thought, oh, I think we're okay. I don't think anybody got hurt. But as his face continued to swell and he talked to, you know, the one thing that the cop was saying that, that took the accident report was saying, you know, you, with, you know, younger kids, you got to make sure that like, you know, sometimes it'll hit them and it'll hurt their neck. And so I asked him about his neck and he was saying his neck didn't hurt at all. But yeah, his face was hurting awful lot and it was swollen. And there was a lot, of, you know, it was nice. And because of so many people coming by and stuff, there was lots of people who stopped and they had a lot of stuff. Like people were like, here, we've got all this water that we were bringing. And so people are giving us bottled water. And there was somebody who pulled out an ice pack. For the boy. Yeah, and gave it to him to put on his face. I assume they must have, you know, had bottled water in a, like a cooler or something along with some ice and ice pack and stuff like that. And so they're like, oh, you know, so lots of people helped us out, which was really nice. Especially considering that I was the only adult there and I had four children, including a baby four months old to deal with and then i had to you know fill out accident reports and all this kind of crap with the police and at this point you'd called nobody to help you i move to go anywhere talking about getting the car out of the road or well, no i mean you were you were well, in front right. of a school how are you going to get out i of what were i you called my wife and told her about it and she said she was going to be coming right away so she was the one that was coming to get us out of there although the problem with that she works far away yeah she works far away but also she had her car and her car seats five and with the baby we now have six so <laughs> once she got there we had to call my sister who wound up being the person that we stayed with during the evacuation to come and and help us out because we couldn't um get all of us into the one car uh that's what the van is for but now the van is incapacitated so yeah my sister's coming out my wife was on her way <laughs> tow truck came along and uh took the van away luckily my wife was there and she waves her arms says, hey make sure you get the car seat out for the baby <laughs> which you wouldn't have thought <laughs> which of. i wouldn't have thought of and then we'd have been totally screwed We'd had no car seat and a baby miles from where there might be another car seat. So it would have been trouble. But luckily we got that. I wish I had thought to get the base 
to the car seat out as well. We have two bases and one car seat and we just, you know, use the one car seat back and forth to the two different cars. And uh, yeah, once the one base is gone in the other car and then later we borrowed the car from you and I was just like, oh, what do we do with the, seat, the baby seat? We had to figure out a way to deal with that until my wife went and got the uh, stuff out of the car. She went and emptied it out this morning so that they can take it off to the salvage yard. Uh, my sister shows up and we start loading stuff a lot of the stuff that was in the van is now getting loaded into her van and uh some of the kids get loaded in we let her take the baby in her car and they headed back to her house and my wife stayed with me and my son we figured we better take him to doctor to make sure he's okay and at this point i called you because you're on the way to the hospital why did you even pick up if all this stuff is going on well there was a lot of people that had heard by this point. I think my uh, my dad, I called and left a message with him and my sister. And, you know, th- at this point, I was just trying to make sure that everybody understood that we were okay. Anybody that was worried. So if, if somebody's calling and I've got a special ringtone for people call me the most. So when you call, I know it's you already. So I knew it was you and I just figured I'd tell you what's up. We uh, We headed back to the house first. Because we thought we might need his his medical card. My wife didn't have it with her. So we went back to the house. That's when I saw my neighbor hanging out in his... Uh, underwear. Yeah, in his underwear. The schlong hanging out. The freaking boxer shorts front. It was... <laughs> he was wearing all this jewelry from the neighborhood. <laughs> right. like he'd gone from house to house gathering. So we come back to the house and we grab a couple of things that we hadn't gotten in the first place. Medicine that, you know, we take it once a day, that kind of stuff. And there was no uh, static to, there was nobody that gave you a hard time when you're coming into your name. There was that same cop that I'd seen on the way out and we just said, yeah, we're just going to get some medication and stuff like that. And he's, you know, as long as we were planning on getting right back out, he was fine with it, I think. Park the car, we come in and we get our stuff, we go back out to the car, we get into the car to leave, I put in the key, try to turn it, and it won't start. (laughs) It wouldn't start! The stupid car, now this car does this. It's one of those things, you know, where they say, oh yeah, your car has a problem, and then you take it to the mechanic, and the mechanic can't get it to do what it does. It's one of those things. I've actually had a mechanic try and fix this problem more than what I've probably spent at least $500 on this stupid problem and still it remains unfixed. But it just does this. It just picks a random time and decides I'm not going to start from 5.30 to 6 on <laughs> Saturday, October 5th or, you know, whatever. It just picks a random time. You have no idea when that's going to be. You get in the car and the lights come on, the radio comes on, there's power to it. You turn the key and nothing happens. It just makes kind of a quiet humming sound. And you keep trying, you keep trying. When it first started doing this, it would only last like for a second. I tried it two or three more times and then it would start. It's steadily gotten worse where you wait five minutes and sometimes it doesn't start. You wait 10 minutes and sometimes it doesn't start. And there was a time when I went to drive home from work, I went out to the car and tried to start it and it took a half hour. I think it was the time I was coming to meet you too. I was just like, oh, I'm going to be so late. Still haven't even left work. Supposed to be there in 15 minutes and it's a 45 minute drive. Oh my gosh. And it finally decided to start. And yeah, this time it decided to do it again. The car would not start as we try to evacuate our neighborhood after our other car has been wrecked. Now this car doesn't want to start. 10 or 15 minutes later, you know, we went back into the house because it was hot. It's the middle of summer and it's hot outside. And now the car is not making air conditioning because the engine is on and so we all went inside and sat around for a while and went back out and tried it again didn't work came back in sat around for a while went back out and tried it again and finally it started up again so i was like okay let's go we got into the car we went to the what do they call those emergency med places it's not like a a, critical care center or something yeah something like that the you know it's not an emergency room it's like a step between the emergency room and just like the making an appointment with a doctor where you can get seen for an emergency. They have all the stuff, 
but they're not open like 24 hours like emergency room is. Since it was regular hours, we were able to just go there. The doctor checked him out. It was kind of fun because, you know, since he got hit in the face, they decided to do x-rays and make sure that no bones were broken. And so we got to do x-rays and see my son's skull and all that stuff. That's always kind of fun. Got some really funky looks at it, too. You know, they were doing one where he was laying down and the x-ray shot up like basically from under his jaw up through. So you could see it from that angle. And I think they were trying to see the bones that are like right under your nose. Or maybe, no, I think it was the ones actually around your eyes. The ones that kind of stick out a little bit to make sure that that wasn't broken. And his braces look really interesting in that shot. (laughs) Because you don't see the skin or anything. So they look like they stick out really far. They went through and pronounced him uh, fit and sent us on our way. And that was pretty much it. After that, we went uh, to my sister's house. We swung by a fast food joint, got ourselves some food, and I had a hard time with that because I could not eat well with my tongue as chunked out. I swear, it looked like I'd bitten a chunk off of it. And any time something went on it, it hurt. I was okay with water, and I got a soda, and that didn't hurt it, but food hurt it. And doing too much talking, I was talking like... I was trying to talk without using my tongue very much, and I was sounding like this a lot. It was <laughs> it was weird. <laughs> it's weird to hear yourself talk like that when you don't mean to be, but you're doing it anyways. I think I remember that day you said, I don't know if I'll be able to talk on Monday. Right, yeah, I was afraid we wouldn't be able to record tonight because I, my tongue would be so mush still because it really hurt. It was really bad. I I ate nothing but smoothies. I would make smoothies where, you know, you blend up blueberries and strawberries and protein powder and some spinach and stuff like that all together to make a little sort of a meal in a a smoothie. And um, I was having that for all my meals. And even then it was still hard. I would try and drink it so that it only went onto the one side of my tongue because, you know, the the left side of my tongue is the one that had the chunk out. So I'd try and get it to pass over the right side of my tongue and down without getting on the left side of my tongue. That's, that's a little bit of a skill you got to learn. It's not something that you just do naturally. <laughs> got to find food that is filling, yet I don't have to chew. I ate peanut butter, just spoonfuls of peanut butter. Although that turned out to not be a good idea because it's a little too sticky. And I wound up just having to use my tongue to dig it out and stuff like that just hurt anyways at what point do you say hey i'm not going into work you know i didn't want to ever say that because i felt bad because obviously this is a big event in news and that's what i do and if i wasn't i knew that someone was already on vacation that day so they're already down a person i didn't want to say hey i'm not coming in I did call and say, hey, I'm going to be late. I, I, I called my boss. She wasn't there. She was doing something. So I left a message, called another boss. He wasn't there. <laughs> left a message on his phone. He later told me he never heard it. Like the entire day he was covering fire and never even heard about it until uh, like Sunday or something. He finally checks his messages. And he's like, oh, crap. <laughs> um, but yeah, I called just regular old assignment desk people and told them about it and the assignment desk editors like you know what i'm just gonna tell them that you're not gonna be able to come in today you know you've got this and that and and i'm like all right i'll let them take it from you yeah at a certain point i would have had to anyways because it just got too late by the time i got my family to my sister's house and at what point do you realize we're not going to be able to go home today I think that happened when we got to my sister's house and actually started checking in on reports, you know, what they're saying about it. Are they saying, yeah, you can go back? You hear from the mayor or whoever it is that's making the announcements for the town, and that's when I realized, nah, great. I guess it was fine because, I mean, we're already out to my sister's house, and, you know, at that point it was no big deal, but... I remember the mayor, he did that press conference from the lawn of his underage lover's house, (laughs) parent's house. Uh, Oh, your joke doesn't work anymore, man. The mayor's a female. 
Oh, shoot. He had the <laughs> most corrupt like city council and any leader of this town. There would be a scandal and the truth would come out and be like, holy cow, another one? Yeah, it was weird. We had some weird scandals with our mayors too, like weird ones. Like a guy who faked his own kidnapping. That's not your normal scandal. And that clinic that you went, isn't that the one where the doctor was videotaping the women in changing? <laughs> no, that was a little further west. That one was actually uh, yeah, a different city than mine. So you're watching the news, and what are they saying about the fire? It's a really big deal, apparently. I mean, and the policeman, actually, who was helping us and did our, our accident report and all that, he said as he was about to leave, well, you know, the good news is it looks like they've got the fire under control and no houses are going to be lost. And I thought, eh, my house is not really that close. I didn't really fear, but that's good. Um, and he headed off to deal with that kind of stuff um but yeah i mean it was still a big deal it was you know you're you're out for the night um i was at my sister's house we were hanging out my kids are playing with their cousins and having a grand old time they love to go to their cousin's house and play so they're happy it's kind of like you know a summer vacation when you go to visit family you know you don't have anything to do that's the one thing that's the trouble. <laughs> Going to my sister's house, stuff that I would do at my house is not available anymore. So I just sit there and relax. And Yeah, I never really felt, even having to stay the night at someone else's house and everything, I never really felt that the fire was going to be a danger for my property, my possessions. I thought it could be possible that some of the houses that are way up on the far end and up the hill... They might have to pay for getting their wonderful view with more than just dollars. <laughs> Protecting homes is the, the number one job of the firefighters that are out there, you know. They're going to let all sorts of grassland burn and stuff like that, but they're going to make sure that the homes don't burn. So uh, two things. The, the next day, Saturday, when did they finally say you could go home? And I know you didn't get home. Or I, I, I'm assuming you didn't go home until 10 or 11 at night. Yeah, it was. Yeah, 10 o'clock at night. I don't know when they finally announced it. They had a phone number that you could call. Oh, okay. And then they also had the Twitter page that you could look for uh, updates on. And I think my wife finally called the phone number and got... That was the one problem with the phone number was you almost never got through. I tried it like... Always busy. Yeah. Yeah. It would go straight to a voicemail that would say, this phone number does not have a voicemail box set up. Goodbye. And so you got nothing. And uh, yeah, my wife did finally get through and they said that the fire was mostly contained. I guess today is the day that it was finally 100% contained. Okay, so I live an, almost an hour away. Mm-hmm. And we had smoke and you could smell it. We smelled right. it yesterday too. And the, just a spectacular sunset. Uh, this <laughs> way. And partly, I guess, it's because there's a lake. So there's no buildings or trees or anything that's blocking. So for miles and miles, you just have open area where the smoke can get to you. But, mm -hmm. And the wind was blowing very heavily in your direction. Oh, okay. That was one thing that I noticed too. When we came back to pick up those things after we, you know, right before we went to the doctor, I looked and it was beautiful here, you know. It was clear and bright and the sun was shining and everything. But just off in that direction, like the fire was there and the, the wind was blowing it really heavy towards the east, towards you. That was another reason why I wasn't too worried about the house is the fire is being blown in the other direction. Um, but yeah, the, the smoke was headed all your way. I was I was slightly worried about that with the house. You know, you just leave it. And I didn't expect it to get burned down, but if it's just getting flooded with smoke the whole, you know, for 24 hours, what is it going to be like inside when it's over? I worried a little bit about how awful smelly was it going to have to wash every cloth thing in the house, drapes to the upholstery, to the clothes, to the bedspreads, you know, or what, what were we going to have to do? But nothing. So that worked out in our favor. The car crash didn't work in our favor, but... <laughs> was So the van was totaled or not? The van was totaled, yes. We got a call from the insurance guy this morning, and he went out and took a look at the van. And and so he, he's coming tomorrow morning, actually, to give me the, uh, the check for our car so that we can go buy ourselves a new one. The interesting thing is about that, though, 
is that when we got the car, it was like four years ago, right about the time that the recession was just getting bad. We're actually making money off of this car, Except which is for nice. Now cars probably cost more. Than yeah, that. I think they do. I think we're gonna have to pay a lot more for the the next car that we get, unfortunately. So if, if people want to help, they can. <laughs> that right? is and true. Sadly, there are only three people listening. Yeah, that Especially is also true. But the one other question I had was, so so what started the fire? I'm assuming it was lightning or maybe sunlight going through broken glass, and, you know, kind of. A- <laughs> no, actually, what started the fire was some dude was out. People do this a lot in this area. He was out with his gun doing target practice up on the hill. And I don't know if he was using specially hot ammo or something like that. He was just having fun shooting his gun, trying to hit some targets, and he sparked a fire. Sad thing is, according to folks at work, this is the 20th fire already this summer. And this is June we're talking about. It started by people target shooting. And, and that's a whole other issue to talk about. But yeah, it is funny to hear. Again, Americans, uh, <laughs> right. don't you dare tell them not to do this. Don't you dare tell them, hey, can you wait until maybe we a rainy day or go someplace where things won't burst into flames. <laughs> yeah, it's I mean, it's kind of hard. That way. I don't have anything against somebody going out and target shooting because that's kind of fun to do. I mean, I've done it once when I was a kid and I really thought it was great. We did some skeet shooting and we did some target shooting, but we were in the middle of the forest that was quite wet. And this has been super dry yeah, for summer. This, this is the driest summer ever. A very and dry so summer. Many fires. There's been a lot of fires, and I just wish people would think before doing it. Just think, well, what would happen? What could happen? Maybe I should have. And that's the other thing. I, th- I think you're supposed to have like a fire extinguisher on hand with you in case something like that happens. So you can rush over and put it out if possible. People don't do that. It's hard enough to carry your gun, your ammo, and your chaw. <laughs> to have to take an extinguisher as well. Uh, anyhow, I, I think you've answered all the questions that I had. All the I, questions I, you asked. Isn't it weird to, that we did it in like an interview format <laughs> kind of thing? But uh, I was curious and I didn't have all the details, so I figured I'd, I'd ask. Yeah, it was interesting. I mean, it was an adventure. Like I said, I I tried to get video and stuff like that because it's crazy stuff. I took pictures of the car all smashed in. I think you're supposed to do that anyways when you're in an accident so that you have like pictures of what the scene looked like or whatever. Although when I talked to the person in the insurance company, they're like, yes, I'd like to let you know that we're going to go ahead and accept fault for this one. And I was like, yeah. Figured you would. <laughs> I, I remember hearing horror stories about that if you don't take a photo or whatever, um, you know, people will say this and this and this has to get fixed on my car. You know, right. you, you did all this damage. So it's a lot more money that I need. And so you're covering yourself by taking the pictures. That was my first big accident. You know, one time 12 years ago, I got rear ended. And that's the extent of my uh, accident history. So. This is the first time I got in an accident. So, you know, it's one of those things to remember. It's like the first time I got a speeding ticket. I think I still have it. Yeah, one of those benchmarks. You, to remember. <laughs> you break your arm or something, you know, you want a picture of yourself with your cast and everything. You get a good shiner or something like that. It's always fun to get a picture of those kind of things. And so well, you sh- took pictures of the boy's face. I too. did. Yeah, I did. Unfortunately, by the time I finally did that, it was it was much less swollen, so oh, it doesn't look as it. ghastly as it could. Yeah, how about your tongue? You get a picture of that? I didn't take a picture of my tongue. Probably should have. How about your butt? Any pictures? I did. I actually took several. I just kind of do that every day. <laughs> I was going to call this episode Bad's Big Day. But the way that you're smiling while you're telling this story and all that, this wasn't the worst day of your life? I don't think so. It was a bad day, definitely. So that would work. I mean, you you didn't want to call it Big's worst day ever. My mom's dead. A day when my mom died, much worse day than just getting in a car accident. Much longer consequences, more things to deal with. Things like that can qualify as worst days ever. Could be like city slickers where worst day ever and best day ever was the same day for that dude who fought with his abusive dad or whatever. It was a crappy day. (laughs) 
But in retrospect, it could have been worse. It could have. Yeah, that's yeah. the thing. That's a healthy attitude because almost it was, all the time things can be worse. Yeah, and it was an. I mean, we're talking a car accident. We're talking airbags deploying. So it's not just a little fender bender. This is a full on totaled car. Although it wasn't like I rolled it or something. And I know. I know somebody who was coming home from a party was following the car that her boyfriend was in. He was like driving one car, she was driving the other. And somebody shot her boyfriend. This same guy that started the fire? No. Oh, okay. This is a completely different thing. I'm talking about a bad day. Somebody shot her boyfriend. She comes around the corner. They've pulled the car off to the side. They're trying to give him CPR. She sees this, but too late hits this car and rolls her car like three or four times before coming to rest, that would be a much worse day than what I did. Okay, well, I know that's a healthy <laughs> attitude. I mean, me, I always look at the glass being half empty and I and I, it's, it's only once you have distance from it or I'm, I'm a pessimistic person, but there are other people that will be like, well, come on, man. This, this, and this didn't happen, or this, this, and this could have happened, or right. And then, and like you said, your kids are all okay. Yeah, they were all fine. And my my youngest daughter was really freaked out about the whole evacuation slash accident thing, and there was a time where she did say, "This is the worst day of my life." Um, but that's possible. Yeah, it, that it, it really is. It probably is. Yeah, I mean, she's only eight. I tried to give her as many hugs as I could while dealing with accident injury. So by the time we got her to her cousin's house, though, she was happy. She loves playing with her cousin. This is a, a super long episode, and a part of me doesn't even want to edit it. <laughs> I just want to put it out because it's timely, and it's it's unlike any episode we've ever had. And then, you know, eventually we want to talk about Brave and things like that. Right. But you and I, we had that Avengers conversation where we talked about our dads and... A couple of days later, it was my mom's birthday, and we were all going to go out and eat dinner for my mom's birthday. And I was out with my sister and my nephews, and she called and said, I've just got a call from your brother, and we're not going to be able to go out to eat tonight. And I was like, oh, oh that sucks. What's, what's wrong? with it? And she's like, well, I'd rather tell you when everybody's together. And instantly, my mind went to, dad is dead. Dad is gone. Big and I were just talking about our memories of our dads and, you know, that I never really got close to him. But part of him is like me, you know, with his love for Westerns and, and all that. And, you know, that that's where my mind went because it was obviously bad news that uh -huh. she didn't want to say over the phone that she wanted right. to say once. And my aunt and uncle had killed themselves that day. And this is what had happened, uh, which is bad news to hit, to get. But. You know, your mind goes to the worst thing that it, it could have been. And, and I thought of that about what, what, what if my dad had died and all that. And, it, you know, as soon as I, as I got around my dad again, all the things that bothered me about him <laughs> came back, you know. And I, I, I try. I do. I ask him questions. I asked him about when Hawaii and Alaska became states in 58. Was that a big deal? Was that... Were there people that didn't want him to become states? How long a process was that and all that? And he's like, he, he didn't want to talk about these things. And it's just, I, I try. I extend an olive leaf so many times <laughs> with that guy. And he, he doesn't like me. And I and I, I, I understand that because for, for a long, long time, and, and even sometimes now, I don't like him back. But, uh, you know, I'll ask him these questions because I hope it'll start a dialogue. Find something that he's passionate about. I mean, I asked him about vaudeville and I, I, I asked him about the war, you know, because my grandpa, his dad was in the war. And, you know, every once in a while, I'll get him on a good day or you get him on a subject, you know, uh, that he wants to talk about. Uh -huh. and, and those are good times. But uh, anyhow, that, that worst day ever thing or, or, or best day or what could be worse. Uh, you made me think of that. And I, I always thought that had he died, that would have been a really interesting episode to re-listen to where right. I was talking about it. it's like holy yeah. cow he's like me but he didn't and so that subject that that conversation will be saved for later yeah. at some point re-listening to that episode is not necessary yet huh well no I, <laughs> I wonder if people even listen to those but for you and me that one is going to be more significant than us talking about just what we thought of the movie right you know things like that because 
I found out something about your dad and you, and you found out something about mine. And in the way that tells us something about ourselves, your, your, your relationship with him and the relationship that you have with your son. And yesterday we were telling me about how you were all into sports and how you were a jock and an asshole. And then later <laughs> you got older and you became a kind of into geeky things and more, more of the unpopular kid stuff. But unfortunately that's when your son was at his most impressionable. And so he's into all of that stuff because of you. Mm-hmm. And you're just like, oh, shoot, he's just going to yeah. see the inside of so many lockers. <laughs> uh, and to me, that's just a, so it, it's, it's something that I never even thought about, that, that whatever you happen to be in when your kid is at a very young age, they're going to be in just by default because they look around and, and who else do they have? What peers do they have? As they get older, and they'll spend more and more time and be more and more influenced by their friends. But w- until they reach a certain age, it's their mom and dad. And, you right. know, the things, my, the political beliefs that my mom and dad had or the religious beliefs or the, the movies that they liked and the things that they did for entertainment, the, the songs that they liked or whatever, are my first exposures to all of those things. Right. I, I don't know. That's so weird to me. My nephew and I live together and I've gotten him so he's so into Avengers right now, way more than I ever was until 2012. And just, <laughs> uh, oh, he always and I think we talked about this in an episode. He always wants to know who would win in a fight between Giant Man and Hulk and things like this. And and sometimes I don't know, but he'll ask these crazy questions like uh, Black Widow versus Galactus and stuff. And it's like, well, t- t- I can't even explain to you how powerful Galactus is and how unpowerful Black Widow is. <laughs> but I can tell he's interested in this stuff because I'm interested in it. And that to me is like an exposure of what it would be like to be a parent. Right. And then, you know, whatever his dad it would be into or whatever his brother is into, you know, those are influences on him. But right now... I'm a very major influence and and that just blows my mind. You know, it's, it's not something that I've ever experienced, even as like a big brother to younger siblings. They always had their friends and they always had school and they always had my parents and all that. Right. Anyway, I'm sorry. I meant to quit talking about this, but anyhow, just bad's a big day. <laughs> I, if there are people still listening. I appreciate you telling me the story again. You told how many times have you told that story today? I've told it a few times. This is probably the most detail I've ever gone into with it. But yeah, everybody at work, you know, I called them and told them that I'd been in a car accident and that I wasn't going to be coming in. And my boss sent around an email so that everybody knew what had happened. And everybody, as soon as I saw, oh, how are you doing? Are you okay? You know, and some people only knew that I'd been evacuated. Some people also knew that I had an accident. Some people knew nothing. There were people on Facebook that were concerned. Yeah, right? there were. And and I, I thought that that was neat, that people that only know us from the show cared. Yeah, it was, it was very nice to know that that was the way it is. You know, that it's like uh, Scott Pig. The guy seemed to have disappeared. Just, and we were worried because he's a military. Right. A hole in the earth opened up and swallowed Scott Pig for all we knew. And the, that's one of those problems is, you know. We don't live down the street from Scott Pig. We can't just go down and check on him. So he disappears and we're like, uh, does anybody know what's happened to him? And there became this Facebook push to find out what in the heck happened to Scott Pig. And uh, eventually word of this got to him and he came and assured us all that he was not indeed dead. That made us all feel a lot better to know that, yeah, he was okay. And now I'm on the other end of it where I'm the guy that was perhaps in trouble. And uh, it's nice to see that everybody cares. You know, I haven't met these people. I have maybe interacted with them online, but, you know, it's a different thing. And to know that they care, it's, it's nice. It's special. Well, I, before you feel too special, Barry Northern didn't care. Ah, uh. I don't know what I picked. You might should have picked somebody else. I just it was the first name that came to mind. All right. Well, that says something about your relationship with Barry Northern. Yes, and they eat a passion. That's the first name that comes to mind. Uh, uh, all right. Well, okay. So, so is it fair to say that this past weekend got your goat? I think it did. Yes, my goat was definitely gotten. It was it was barbecued in that fire. My poor goat. But it made for a nice meal later. Yeah, I, I had an equally bad weekend because I saw 
Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter. So, you know, I think your story and my story, we could swap those. Yeah, yeah. I really didn't like the short Pixar film before Brave 2. So, you know, I, I, I feel your pain. I hear you. All right. Thanks for listening, folks. We'll see you next time. All right. Take care. That Gets My Goat is produced under a Creative Commons 3.0 license. Boy, they must really think a lot of themselves.